Good morning, everyone. Welcome today. It's great to be with you this beautiful day. The book of Romans reminds us to offer ourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and the parts of our bodies to him as members of righteousness. So if you would, we're going to stand together, please, and we're going to sing together, reminding ourselves of the commitment we made to Christ with hymn number 596. Let's sing, I Surrender All. out and find somebody you can welcome this morning, and then we're going to continue in worship and song. this morning. This is called Love Came Down, and we'll sing of how Jesus came and changed everything in our lives. We're going to sing this chorus once, and then have you join in with us. It sounds like this. I will sing forever of your love come down, with my hands to heaven shout your praises loud. I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out. I will sing forever Let's try that together one more time. Here we go. One, two. I will sing forever of your life, God, and with my hands in the hands of Jesus. I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out. I will sing forever of your life. Oh, good. I once was blind, I once was blind, but I did not see chains of sin and death.
Thank you, Father. We are so thankful to be in your, in your presence, in your home this morning, to be gathered as your sons and daughters, and to be reminded that it's because of what you did on the cross and how you rose and conquered the grave that we can have hope for eternity. So build us up through our songs, through our singing, through our hearing of your word, through our prayers, and help us to go out this week with eyes wide open to see what you might have in our path and how we might serve you. We praise you because you live.
And Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of those words and the confidence that they inspire within us by the power of your Holy Spirit. The grave could not hold him. Death could not be victorious. For it was your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, who rose from the dead and has ascended into your glorious presence. He has made a way for us that we would not be lost to the price of our sin, but would be found righteous before you forevermore. Father, may that create within us a voice of worship and praise. May it create within us a longing to bring you glory and honor. And may it instill within us a strength and commitment to live lives of loving obedience to the timeless truth of your word. Father, we love you. And we are responding to how you have loved us first. Thank you for Jesus. Receive all of our worship now, for we bring it in his precious name. Amen. And brothers and sisters in Christ, may you always know the love of God our Father and the amazing grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as all God's people say, amen. Please be seated. And we were just able to sing what we believe, and now we are able to have Mallory and Remington come forward, brother and sister by birth, and this morning, brother and sister by their confession of faith in Jesus Christ. They stand before you, they stand before God to answer these questions again regarding what has happened in their hearts and regarding how they long to live their lives. Mallory Remington, thank you for your willingness to stand and to claim this life. Do you receive Jesus and only Jesus to be your Savior and your Lord. Mallory, do you? Remington, do you? And do you believe that Jesus is the only way? He said he is the way and the truth and the life. There is no one else. Remington, do you believe that? Mallory, do you believe that? Thank you. God loves you so much that he gave you his word. Mallory, what's the name of that book? The, the Bible. Do both of you promise to live your lives loving this truth and by the Holy Spirit trying to live lives that honor this truth? Remington, will you do that? Mallory, will you do that? Those are all promises that you make on the inside. Those are all things that you believe. But now, will you live your life in such a way that whenever there's an opportunity to worship and to praise God, you will make the most of that opportunity, whether it be inside of a church building or out and about during the day. When communion is being celebrated, when baptism is being shared, will you please be a part of those special occasions? Will you walk with other Christians? This is your family now. It's part of your family. Will you walk with brothers and sisters in Christ, loving them, caring for them, Will you use your gifts and your talents for God? You know that you have gifts. You know that you have talents. Will you use them for his kingdom work? Will you also, when you stumble, when you fall, will you let others come alongside of you and encourage you in your faith walk that you would not fall away, but that you'd be brought back again into the presence of God? And finally, by the power of his Holy Spirit, Will you seek to live a life that brings God the glory and the honor and the praise as you live in peace and in purity? Mallory, with the power of God's Holy Spirit, will you seek to live that kind of life? And Remington, with the power of God's Holy Spirit, will you seek to live that kind of life? Amen. Our elder, Tom Miedema, is going to join us in a circle of prayer. Church, will you please join with us? And Heavenly Father, I praise you and I thank you 
for Mallory's life, for Remington's life. That they are not lost, they are not wandering, but they have been found by you and they have responded to the voice of the Good Shepherd. Father, thank you that you know them by name. You claim them as your own through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And you are now faithful to walk with them every moment of their lives. Father, may they always keep their eyes and their minds and their hearts turned to you. Thank you for what you've done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, would you please go ahead and praise God for what he has done in Remington and Mallory's life. They will be at one of the doors in the back following our worship this morning. We also have the privilege of recognizing uh, the gift of three children who have been received from God by his design. And so uh, Brian and Megan, uh, Eric and Michelle, and Jordan and Stephanie are going to come forward at this time. They're going to stand before you uh, with their daughters and with their son. They've already acknowledged that these children are gifts immediately from God, and now they long that their children should be identified with the sign and seal of baptism. Since you, the parents of these children, desire uh, that they receive the sign and seal of holy baptism, you are to give sincere answer to these questions. First of all, do you accept the gospel of God's grace in Jesus Christ, the good news, the best news that's ever been told in the truth of the Old and New Testament? Brian and Megan, do you? Eric and Michelle, do you? And Jordan and Stephanie, do you? Thank you. Do you acknowledge, according to that truth, that your children were conceived and born in sin? That's bad news. But do you believe and do you acknowledge the rest of the story? That God receives our children through the gift of Jesus Christ. That we are not righteous on our own, but the righteousness of Jesus Christ covers us and forgives us of our sins. Do you believe the whole truth of God's word? Brian and Megan, do you? And Eric and Michelle, do you? And Jordan and Stephanie, do you? Thank you. Then what will you do? That's what you believe. And it's great that you believe those things in your heart. But now how will you share those things with your children? Do you promise, first of all, that you will pray with them and you will teach them how to pray, that you will love them in your arms, that you will train them up by your precept and your example, and that you will always seek to share the whole truth of God's word with them. And of course, you cannot do that on your own, but with the power of God's Holy Spirit, Will you bless their minds? Will you bless their hearts with the name of Jesus? Brian and Megan, will you do that? Eric and Michelle, will you do that? And Jordan and Stephanie, will you do that? Thank you. We are going to introduce some children this morning. Good morning. In my arms here, with some beautiful blue eyes is Sadie Genevieve. And Sadie means one who is a beautiful princess. And we certainly believe that when our Heavenly Father is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that makes us royalty. Sadie Genevieve. Genevieve meaning one who also has inner beauty. So not only are you a princess, but you have beauty on the inside as well. Sadie Genevieve. And up next, we have a handsome little boy that we have been praying for, who has on a very nice bow tie this morning. This is Landon James. And Landon means one who has been comforted. 
And God has certainly comforted you. And Landon, God has certainly kept you safe. Landon James. James meaning one who is nurtured. And Landon James, we pray that your mom and dad nurture you and that they bring you to the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Landon James. I might have to borrow that bow tie. You're more than willing. There you go. And finally, sleeping. Sleeping peacefully. <laughs> this is Natalie Jade. And Natalie means a priceless gift from God. And as if Natalie did not reaffirm that enough, Jade again means priceless. And so this priceless gift of life is ours to hold in our arms, ours to love, and ours to encourage with the name of the Lord. Church family, if you're able to stand, would you please do so? We never take life for granted. And we know that we are not in control. Our Heavenly Father knows what's best. And He has blessed us with each of these lives. And so as you meet them, perhaps for the first time, will you now make your promise that you will do everything you can by the Holy Spirit to introduce them, to teach them, to train them, and to love them, that one day they would be more engaged to confess Jesus is their Lord and Savior. If you will do that, then with one voice, please say, we will. Thank you. Please be seated. Brian and Megan, I invite you to come forward. And as you place Sadie's head over the water, Sadie Genevieve, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of God's Holy Spirit. God bless you. Amen. And Eric and Michelle come forward with Landon James. And Eric, I invite you to hold him over the water. Landon James, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of God's Holy Spirit. God bless you. Amen. And Natalie Jade, Natalie Jade Naderveld, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of God's Holy Spirit. God bless you. Amen. And congregation, we invite you to join us one more time for a circle of prayer together. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for generations that are represented here. We thank you for parents, for grandparents. We thank you for children and for grandchildren. Father, they are dependent upon us. They are in our arms. And how will they know the truth unless we show them and unless we tell them the way? So strengthen these parents now and continue to draw these children to yourself through the power of your Holy Spirit. And we will pray this always in Jesus' name and all God's people say, amen. Would you go ahead and praise God one more time for the gift of each life here. And they are again receiving a certificate to help them remember the promises they have made, the promise we have made, 
and also a children's storybook Bible to help them as they continue to train up their children in the way of the Lord. They'll be at one of the doors in the back following our worship this morning. Please be sure that you continue to encourage them. Many opportunities to be together in prayer. Let's do just that. Heavenly Father, you are so good. Who are we in this place that you would bless us with the gift of life? Father, life and the responsibility to hold in our arms. Father, life with the privilege of going about each and every day with responsibilities and a schedule. But Father, most importantly, life found in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Thank you again for Remington and for Mallory. Thank you for what you have done. And thank you that by the gift of Jesus Christ, eternity has been changed for them. Father, for the woman or for the man who is here this morning, whether they be an adult of many years or a child who is now understanding for the first time, by the power of your Holy Spirit, may there be no hesitation. Against the best attempts of Satan, may there be no excuses offered. But Father, hearing what Jesus has done and being convinced of each of our needs, may we respond to that greatest of gifts. May we not simply sing that we believe, but help us to do so in our hearts. And Father, even as we celebrate eternal life, it has us to celebrate Ron Artema's life. Thank you for the confidence and the assurance that was in that hospital room last week for children and for grandchildren, for Fran, a faithful wife, to be able to hear. As Brian and, and Julie laid to rest a father, thank you for the confidence that they knew. His life was not lost and this is not a goodbye, but it was an assurance that there's complete healing, that death and that ALS would have no victory. Father, great is your faithfulness. That's why we can trust you for every surgery this week. That's why we can trust you for the timing. That's why we can understand and believe that you are working even as the report has not yet been received. So be in every room, be in every appointment, and Father, accomplish your will, which is always best. And now too, we ask that you would receive the offering that we bring. And Father, may we never be selfish. May we never hold back. But may we always know it is for your kingdom and it is for your glory. And we will pray this always in Jesus' name and all God's people say, amen. We do invite our deacons to come forward at this time. It's our joy, it's our privilege to bring to God the tithe that he asks and the offering that we present. You'll also find a fellowship pad, that black vinyl binder located at the end of a pew may need to reach for it, but if you're visiting us today and you have some questions, uh, let us know that too, and we'll do our best to contact you throughout the course of this week. And also, when we consider bringing an offering to God, part of our offering, part of our worship is testifying to what God has been doing in our lives. We're supposed to be sharing our stories together. Eric and Michelle are going to share their story with you. God has been faithfully at work in their lives. God is continuing to be faithfully at work in their lives. And so I invite you now into their testimony, even as you have a testimony of your own. Listen. Um, I'm Eric. And I'm Michelle, and we're the Geislers. And we have been at Fellowship for almost eight years. Um, we wanted to spend a year or two, just the two of us as a couple. Um, we had dated five years, so we were pretty ready for kids when we got married. 
Um, we started doctoring pretty fast. Um, Eric's dad is a physician and he encouraged us to kind of get on that path pretty fast because things weren't happening naturally for us, so. You see people around you getting pregnant constantly and it seems like it comes naturally easy for them, but it, it wasn't for us. I mean, everybody says trust in God, but that's tough to do when you're put in that situation. I think people were really supportive and they tried to understand, but unless you're living it, and that's true for anything, unless you're living the same exact journey or something similar, you know, I think our friends and family were really supportive the whole time, but we still felt alone. And even when our match fell through this spring, it was like, okay, this is finally it. And then when that fell apart, I think that was probably when I got the most angry at God because it was in our grasp. We got really good at masking our feelings Yeah. when we were around. Some that was people. hard. That was really hard. You just put a mask on and cover it up. And I think we took we took turns being up and down, which is a blessing. And I, I'm, I'm thinking God blessed us in that way because um, Eric would be having a, a really bad moment and I'd be like, nope, it's okay. And I'd try to pump him up and, and vice versa. We felt like we were so ready. You know, even at year one and a year two, it was like, what, what else can we do to be ready? You know, we have the house, we have the nursery, we have good jobs, we have financial stability, we, we go to church, we have family. We, I mean, we felt like we had everything but this missing piece of the puzzle. When you talk to God, it's like, is there something I'm supposed to change in my life? Is there something that we're supposed to be doing mm -hmm. spiritually that will open this door or is this just a timing thing? So Landon's birth parents are both um, high school students. We had five days notice of his arrival. I don't think it really set in that he was ours. I'm not sure it fully has set in at this point, at eight weeks in, that he's ours. Everything that you hear at church about how God loves you, you really realize that when you're holding your own child mm -hmm. and the love you have for that child, you realize God loves me this much. I think for me, when I saw Landon, it kind of all just clicked into place and I thought, okay, God, this, I get it. And, I, and I, you know, obviously it's always hindsight when you look back and you think, why? Why five years? Why a reversal? Why um, infertility? Why all the doctoring? Why, 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 why? We ask why so many times. Um, and I look in his face and I think, this is it. This Landon was destined to be our child. God knew that five years ago. Looking back at those, all those things that happened, it's just a really cool journey. Um, so I guess I would encourage people and just say the journey's hard, but um, the end is the end is worth it. And, and God's end is always it's always the best. Um, and not to say that it in our human minds it's always best, but it's always it's always what needs to be. Um, maybe that's not comforting, but um, God God's timing is always. Perfect. It is. For this child, I have prayed and you.
You thank God for the way He continues to work in each of our lives. So we testify to what God is doing, and we acknowledge that it oftentimes is outside of our control, and it is often not in our schedule, but God's timing continues to unfold in our lives, and that's why no matter where we are today, we know that the story continues. And so whatever your experience is, when you celebrate, as a church, we celebrate with you. When you are facing trial and adversity, we promise to walk with you and to share in your tears. Every story matters. We turn to God's story, Luke 14. Luke 14, verse 25, continuing with our series looking at the stories of Jesus, the parables that he shared with his disciples and with the ongoing crowds who pursued him and the crowds that continued to grow. And with that word open, let's pray together once again. Heavenly Father, you are so good to us. Sometimes we struggle to see your hand at work. Oftentimes we struggle because the timing doesn't seem perfect and it's not making any sense. But Father, you are faithful, and the power of your Holy Spirit is still active and alive within us. And so, please speak to us now again through the power of your word. Father, meet us where we are and draw us nearer to you in our commitment and in our love. And we will pray this always in Jesus' name. Amen. Be honest with me this morning. If you are going to a restaurant and someone else promises to pay, immediately your eyes go to the expensive entrees. Be honest. If you know your parents are going to pay, if your friends are going to pay, if another person is going to pay, you may order an entree, with an appetizer, maybe a salad if you believe in vegetables. You may even put an early order in for dessert. When someone else is going to pay, you want the very best. But have you ever had the experience where someone invites you out for a meal? Somebody wants to take you out. In fact, they tell you to choose the restaurant. You pick the restaurant. Where do you want to go? There's been a steakhouse. You've wanted to go to that steakhouse for a long time. And and when you arrive and when you sit down, you are impressed by all of the wait staff who are there. You begin to go through the menu. You notice that things have no price. All it says is market value. Wow. That must be really good if it's market value. They tell you you need to order things a la carte. 
That's French for it's very expensive. And, and so you go through. And, and you are ordering because you've been invited out. They want to do this for you. You're holding nothing back. And they continue to bring all of these tasty and satisfying tidbits to the table. And because they're paying, everything is delicious. Nothing is wrong with this meal. But finally, the meal's done. And the wait staff are coming back to your table. They walk over to your friend, and they place the bill by your friend. Then they come around to your side of the table. And next to your place setting, they have a second bill. Now you are looking up at your friend, longing for any sense of a breathing pattern or heartbeat within them looking for any gesture or request for the bill itself. And what are they doing? They are taking out their debit card and attaching it to their bill. In that moment, you realize they are not paying for you. And suddenly, as you look at that bill, all you can think about is your grocery budget for the next two weeks. And everything that was previously delicious is now turning sour in your stomach. As you put down your cash or your check or your debit card, you want to scream at the top of your lungs, I thought you were paying. Say that with me. I thought you were paying. And as Christians, many of us sit across the table from Christ. And we love to fill ourselves on what he has done. Many of us sit across the table from Jesus Christ and we love to fill ourselves on what he has done. Jesus paid it all. And so we take his love, we take his grace, we take his forgiveness, we claim his righteousness. Jesus paid it all. And we love to sit across from him taking it all in. And at some point in time, as Christians, as those who call themselves disciples or followers of Jesus, at some point in time, we forgot there is a cost. Say that word with me, a cost. There is a cost in following Jesus. The story continues. Luke 14 at verse 25. Listen to the word of God. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace in the same way. Any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. We love to sit across from Christ, taking it all in, 
knowing that Jesus paid it all, but it is important for the Christian sister, it's important for the Christian brother to know that there is a cost, there's an investment that is required on our part as we agree to follow Jesus and as we call ourselves disciples. So this morning, I am reminded, this morning, I pray you are reminded of the cost associated with following Jesus. The very first cost that we understand, number one, is that we must confess Christ. Say that with me. We must confess Christ. We confess Christ. We confess Christ. He is, he is my Savior. He is my Lord. Now, Pastor Sean, he's my Savior. He's my Lord. That's not a cost for me, right? That's a gift, it is a gift that, that Mallory and Remington received this morning, and you're absolutely right. The forgiveness of our sins is a gift from Jesus Christ. Romans 6 verse 23 tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, say that with me, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The forgiveness of our sins is a gift. You cannot earn it, you cannot buy it, you cannot achieve it on your own. But for the follower of Jesus, we need to confess Christ in our lives. And when you confess Christ in your life, he becomes not number three, he becomes not number two, he wants to be what? Number one. When you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he wants to be number one. He wants to be first. He wants to be preeminent. He wants to sit upon the throne of your heart. And that's going to cost you something. Because many of us love to sit on that throne ourselves. Many of us have other, other people or ideas that sit upon that throne in our heart. But when you confess Jesus Christ, it means he's preeminent, he is first, he sits on the throne, and he is in charge. Nobody else. Jesus explains this in verse 26. He says, if anyone comes to me and does not, what? Hate. Say that word with me. Hate. It's an awful word. We gristle when we hear that word. Jesus uses that word. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Jesus wants to be first. He says, you confess me, then you make me preeminent. I want to be before your spouse. I want to be before your children. I want to be before your brothers, before your sisters, before anyone else. Jesus says, I want that place of authority. I want to lead. I know what's best. First place. It's not that Jesus is telling you to hate your mom or your dad. Jesus is not telling you to hate your siblings. What he is saying in very bold language to get our attention is that we need to love him first, to put him first, and to keep him first in our lives. You see, sometimes that place of firstness goes to a spouse. You may have a spouse who is always the one filling up the schedule. You may have a spouse who is always the one making plans. You may have a, a spouse who is always the one leading, and unfortunately, not leading nearer to Jesus, not leading deeper into God's Word, not leading towards any activity that represents the mercy or the compassion of Christ to others. And yet at times, as spouses, we can be very demanding. And it takes us away from Jesus. Or, or maybe that spot of preeminence, that spot of firstness, has gone to your children. Our children, 
they are some of the busiest folks. Our children, our grandchildren, they are one of the busiest generations. There are so many expectations upon their lives from, from school and, and, and sports and extracurricular activities and friends and jobs and employment, all these opportunities. Our children can be so incredibly busy. And many times we, we allow our children to have that preeminent place in our lives. We put our children first. And our children's schedules dictate our lives. And we will follow them. We'll follow our grandchildren wherever they go, whatever they're doing. During the course of the week, over the course of a weekend, a Saturday, a Sunday, even if it's a traveling team, we want to support them, right? We want them to know that we love them. But in doing so ongoingly, we tell Jesus, you are not preeminent. Jesus, you are not first. They are. So who is on that throne right now? Who would you say is, is preeminent? Who would you say is first in your life? You let them lead. You let them steer. You let them determine. But as you do that, you tell Jesus that he is not first. You see, for the one who is a follower of Jesus Christ, it's going to cost you something. When you confess Christ, it means he's first. And others have to get in line behind him. Amen, church? And we confess Christ, but, but we, we do something else. In, in following that confession, we're also told to carry our cross. Say it with me. Carry our cross. For some reason, this reference, the, the bearing one's cross, the carrying one's cross, it has developed a mistaken identity over time. We often say, well, I guess this is just my cross to bear. I suppose this is just my, my cross to carry. You know what? I, I hurt here. I hurt here. This part of my life isn't going well. Uh, those people are, are, are treating me this way. And we chalk that up to our cross to carry, our, our burden to bear. That's not what Jesus means in this passage. When Jesus is speaking of carrying our cross, he means it in relationship to how we are following him and what we are doing for him. He says it this way in verse 27. Jump back into God's word there. He says, anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. If you've got God's word open, look there in verse 27. Let's read it together. Here we go. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have a cross to bear. Jesus says, you are going to follow me. You are going to do the will of our Father in heaven. And he says, as you follow me to do God's will, he says, it is not going to be easy. Because in this world, when you speak the name of Jesus Christ, in this world, when you seek to do the will of God, our Heavenly Father, in this world, when you long to lovingly live out, obediently live out the truth of God's word, it's not going to be easy. Jesus says, you are my followers. It's going to get difficult. Jesus says those who carry a cross, those who bear the weight of being a faithful gospel witness, a faithful gospel witness, regardless of where you are, regardless of who you are with, if you are honest to the truth of the gospel, you're going to get in trouble. Of, of that first gang of cross carriers, Peter, 
And upon this rock I shall build my church. Peter, they crucified him. He asked to be crucified upside down because he believed that that crucifixion upright was only good enough for Jesus. Thomas, you remember him, he dared to ask Jesus the question, how do we know where you're going? Jesus says, I'm the way and the truth and the life. Thomas believed that and he shared that with people. What happened? He was driven through with a spear and killed. Bartholomew, you know, that's the disciple that we oftentimes forget about. His reputation, according to tradition, they, they skinned and, and filleted his body before cutting off his head. Philip was imprisoned before he was crucified. Andrew was whipped and beaten, and then he was crucified. But instead of using nails for Andrew, they used rope, and they tied him to the cross because it was more painful. It would take longer. It would be more excruciating. He suffered, they believe, for at least two days. What do they have in common? They carried their cross. They were followers of Jesus Christ. They made an agreement to believe and to live out the truth, and they suffered for it. They were humiliated, they were mocked, they were chased out of town, they were beaten, they were whipped, So at at what point in time and and, and in what way can we carry our cross? You know, we need cross carriers in the classroom. You know, if you are here this morning and if you are in third grade, thank you. If you are here this morning and you are getting your third master's degree, that must be very expensive for you. But regardless of what level of education you are at, there's an opportunity in that classroom to carry your cross. As you are writing, as you are speaking, as you are arriving at a point in your presentation or in your paper, you write as a follower of Jesus Christ. And it may get you in trouble. It may lower your grade, impact your GPA, cost you a scholarship. But your eternal life in Jesus cannot be taken away from you. You carry your cross at work. All kinds of folks that you work with, that you serve with, They don't know Jesus. Some of them want nothing to do with Jesus. They don't want you to use his name unless it's in a derogatory way. They don't want you to pray. They do not want any Christian gospel influence. Will you carry your cross at work? Will you speak the name of Jesus? Will you be motivated by the love of Jesus? Regardless of what happens. Even when it may lead to your dismissal. What about a church? Will a church carry the cross? When the world begins to tell her what she may teach and what she may not teach, what she may preach, what she may not preach, when the world tells her this is what you may believe, this is what you may not believe, when the world will say that is hate speech, are you willing to bear the cross even when a church begins to shrink because folks fall away and they're more interested in the world than they are in being true followers of Jesus Christ. 
would you continue to bear and carry your cross? So we confess Christ. He is preeminent. He is first place in our lives. Uh, uh, we confess Christ. We, we are carrying our cross no matter what. We are living out the truth of the gospel no matter where we are, no matter what folks try to do to us. And finally, number three, quickly, we are calculating the cost. Say that with me calculating the cost. So calculate the cost right now. We're going to do a personal inventory. Everything that you have, everything that you own, everything that is bankrolled, everything that's in your stock portfolio, all of your possessions that are in the garage, that are in the basement, that are in the outbuilding, that are up north, that are down south, that you have hidden, and the bank accounts your wife doesn't know about. Shame on you. Do a personal inventory for a moment and get all of those things before you look at those things and then tell me, may God have them all. May God have all of it. If God asks for it, if God wants it, may God have it all, calculate the cost. Jesus says in verse 28, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Everybody loves Jesus when he's talking about love, when he's talking about grace, when he's talking about forgiveness, when he is healing their lives. Everybody loves Jesus. But we then get to this moment, and Jesus is talking about the fact that it's going to cost us something to follow him. And it's so often the case, we, we are good at laying a foundation. We, we are excited. There is a commitment. This is new. Jesus Christ is my Savior. He is my Lord, and I'm beginning to build. I'm beginning to build up my life in him. And then you get to that point where all of a sudden, hold on, this is getting kind of expensive. You know, I, I like Jesus. I like this idea of, of being forgiven. I like it when we celebrate communion. I, don't get me wrong. I like Jesus, and I love what Jesus has done for me, that he has paid it all. But, but wait a minute. Exactly how much of my life am I supposed to give to him? And so we have a whole lot of partial building projects that have taken place. And there's many of us who, who pause and we step back. And I say, you know what? God, I'm not really sure I want to give you that. You know what, God? I, uh, God, that's, that's mine. God, I, 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 you know... God, I know you want it, but God, that, that's mine. I know you want to invest it in the kingdom. God, I, I know you want to use it over here. God, I, I know it is yours for them. But you know what, God? Really, it's mine. And you know what, God? I just really need to take care of me. Me first. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. What am I hanging on to so tightly? What, what am I so white-knuckled with? that I refuse to give it to God or make it available to God. 
I calculate the cost. And I get stuck. As he calculated the cost and walked all the way to the cross, Jesus looks through time and he sees me. He sees you. And knowing full well what it would require of him, knowing full well what it would cost of him, he went all the way there to die and to suffer, even to have the very face of God the Father turned away from him. And yet Jesus looked at you and he said, you are worth it. Jesus looked at you across time and he said, you, you're worth everything. It's the investment that he has made in your eternal life by laying down his own. You're that important to him. And so we love to sit at this table and to celebrate how he did that and how he paid it all. But then when we walk away from this table and when we consider the cost of following him, will we keep him first? Will we give him all we have? And will we suffer and bear no matter what it takes? Pray with me. Father, thank you for your one and only son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for his willingness to go all the way to the cross for me. Father, on my own, I am pathetic and I am in a miserable, death-prone position. But because of the love of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, I have been afforded eternal life. Father, that's the story for every man and woman and child who is here today to claim that gift of Jesus. But may the story never stop there. Father, help us to be faithful followers, no matter the cost, no matter what is required, with heart and soul and mind and strength. Use us for your kingdom glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you're able to stand for God's parting blessing, would you please do so? God loves you. And God has done all of that for you and with you in mind. Jesus paid it all. But there is others who need to hear that truth and know that truth, to have an opportunity to believe upon that truth. And God wants to use you towards that end. Are you willing to be that faithful of a follower? I pray you will be. And as you serve him well, may you always know the love of God our Father, the amazing grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit now and forevermore, as all God's people joyfully say, amen. Cornerstone, let's sing together. Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest prayer, but holy trust in Jesus' name. My hope is filled. I'm nothing less than Jesus.